Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction, Vicky. Um, the first thing I would like to do also is acknowledge I'm on Jaja Warung country, which is uh, central Victoria. Um, I'm in the Macedon Ranges and um, it is cold and wet and it is beautiful. And so I want to acknowledge the care and custodianship of our First Nations people of this beautiful country that I'm on. And also, as you have, Vicky, acknowledged that it is stolen land and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so I just want to give you a little bit of background. Um, you've provided some for us, Vicky, for me, Vicky, which is fantastic. So um, Women's Health Gob and North East um, has been around for about 30 years um, and we're one of 12 women's health services um, in Victoria funded by the state government to work on primary prevention and health promotion work. So our job is to create the environment that creates health. So it's very long-term work that we do. Um, we, we try to look at systemic change rather than individual behavioural change. And our aspirations, um, we, we can't say that we hold them as values because we're not actually um, living them, I guess, yet. We're working towards them. So one of our key aspirations is embedding care in everything that we do. Um, we see anti-oppression um, as a way to lead us to achieve equity and inclusion, collective liberation, agency and solidarity. Those are the things that we believe as an organisation we can work towards so that we can uh, we can make a change in our world. Um, Australia Remade um, is, was our partner on this project um, and uh, we met Australia Remade um, a few years ago now when they were researching for a project called Reclaiming Our Purpose. It's time to talk about the public good. And um, this piece of work they consulted far and wide across Victoria and they basically sort of came out of that with that there are a handful of basic goods and services that people want to be available to everyone. Um, things like um, these things came up time and time again in every conversation and group, regardless of people's socioeconomic um, resources, their location, their cultural background or their political leadings. So they wanted housing, healthcare, education, jobs, access to nature, access to the internet. But when Australia Remade went a bit deeper, they found that there was this beautifully sincere longing um, for three core things. Um, the opportunity to connect with each other and with place, the ability to care and be cared for, and pathways to contribute locally and nationally to who we are as communities and a nation. And um, that value of care, and certainly we're very on board with all of those things, but that that uh, attribute of care really connected for us. Um, so we started a partnership and we did some further research. And so this has led us to where we are now. So our initial, this project that we did together called Care Through Disaster has um, led to two different, uh, a part one and a part two of reports. So the first part of it is, um, uh, care Through Disaster, a new lens on what's needed to survive through tumultuous times. And um, we we do love uh, things coming in threes. And um, the research there um, led us to understand that people wanted to be seen for who they are. They wanted to be seen for their place in the community, their unique values, their unique um, being. They wanted to be safe through any disaster, of course. Um, you know, they wanted to be come out alive. They wanted their um, their animals and pets and they wanted their land to be safe. They also wanted to be supported. Um, so that didn't mean that they were looking for welfare. What they were saying was that they wanted to be supported in that they knew what they needed. But, of course, in times of disaster, um, it's hard sometimes to, to step up and do what you need. So the support that people are looking for through, that they told us in this research is they wanted to be seen and safe 
and have support to get the things that they needed to get through this process. So that report is um, is on our website and available. And, and Vicky, of course, um, it's available to everybody. Um, so we can pass on the link for that for you to read. But what I wanted to talk about tonight is the second part of the report, um, which is the toolkit that we developed. Because we said, well, these things are all fantastic and and they are true and it's what people have said, but how do we do it? Um, so we... Um, we developed the practical framework and what we did was we applied a care lens to disaster, which helps us take a more collective and long-term approach. And it expands our view of disaster infrastructure to include not only buildings, but the enabling infrastructure of community connection and cohesion, which goes back to Australia Remade's original research that they did. And it encourages us to take a more relational, less transactional approach, um, particularly to education and engagement, but also through disasters as well. Um, it challenges us to find innovative ways to better insulate people from impacts, um, whether they're financial or otherwise, and um, uh, sorry, the impacts of growing systemic disaster risk. Um, and it also demands that we harness government and public sector for the public good to build communities' capacity to rise to our biggest challenges. So the last thing we wanted to do was say, community, you have to do all the work. Um, so what we did was we came up with some practical things that, um, and I'm not going to go into these deeply. These are within the report. I'm not going to go into them deeply now, but I'm going to provide some examples in a moment. So we said citizens. These are the things that you can do around <laughs> disaster. You can get personally prepared, build relationships and capacity, and build and maintain ways of keeping in touch. We'll talk about those in a minute. We've got some things for community organisations like yourselves. So doing education by conversation, not just broadcast. Learning how to listen and accepting that this all takes time. So, of course, to do all those things, we need the support to do that. And that is where local government, state government and federal government come in. So I won't, in the interests of time, I know we haven't got a lot of time here, I won't read through those now, but I am going to talk about some examples for some of these things. So then we go to federal government. And so, um, and also, sorry, I am speaking fast. If you need me to slow down or you want me to go over anything again, please do. Um, it's it's been one of those days where I've just been keeping going today. So I find myself getting faster and faster. So I'll make a effort to slow down. Um, so I guess as citizens, um, you know, we experience the moment of a flood or fire or storm or extreme heat event. Um, we just try to get through it. So disaster preparation and survival information typically targets us as individuals with prepare, act, survive, and things like if it's flooded, forget it. Um, we're also encouraged um, to see preparation as a collective action. We're getting to know people around us is seen, um, sorry, we're also not encouraged <laughs> to see it or supported to see Preparation is a collective action where getting to know people around us is seen as a strategic disaster preparation work. So um, what we wanted to do is think about, well, how do we learn what to do, how to help before disaster strikes? Um, and this is, again, where agency comes in. People do have agency and there's some key things that we can do. While there are a lot of things out of our control, there are key things we can do. So getting prepared. We have things like sources like the Australian Red Cross, the ABC Emergency Online, like emergency service groups, they can help us learn how to prepare our home, actively shelter in place, when to evacuate, where to go, what supplies to have handy. Um, we can also speak with our knowledgeable neighbours. Uh, when we were flooded here, um, we couldn't get out. Our road was um, Our road was blocked by trees. 
one of our wonderful neighbours came out with their tractor, cleared the tree. Then we were able to go the back way around and somebody else had put down some gravel for people to get through. So you talk to your knowledgeable neighbours, you see um, what your local council has to offer. Um, so there's there's that sort of planning that we can do. We can build relationships and capacity. We can get together with others. And um, what I should say is um, um, my our wonderful colleagues at Australia Remade um, really did the deep thinking about this and really reached out to community and have some beautiful examples. And there was often examples of food, getting together over food um, and playing, making it, it, it is serious, but we can bring out some joy into that connection that we have with each other. So, um, you know, a lot of things that we can do include where we're looking at, um, uh, say, knitting groups, reading groups, um, when we're playing sports, um, when we're getting together like Friends of the Earth are getting together and, you know, and we're, we're thinking about our climate action, when we're going to yoga, you know, like there are ways that we can build connection in community so that we know, we know who is around, we know who needs help, we know how we can help. Um, so it's getting together in real life is really important. And I think that's not something that I need to tell you. I think this is something that you're doing so beautifully. Um, we also need to build and maintain ways to keep in touch. So WhatsApp groups, telephone trees, wine and cheese nights, um, sharing information about what you will do in the event of an emergency, getting to know your neighbours better and enjoying where you live in the process. Because one of the things that we found through this is this isn't only about disasters. This is about how we live more meaningfully now and how we can enjoy how we live now so that then I'm not going to say if, when disaster strikes, we have more capacity and we we've, we have joy in things that we can share. Um, so the reason that a women's health organisation thinks about this, um, one of the things that we see is that care is consistently devalued. It's seen as soft and fuzzy it's seen as something that women do and not particularly important now that's not to say men don't care and men don't do that that's not what I'm saying at all but what I'm saying is there is a perception there that it's not valuable and it's something that just women do so um it's it's what earlier generations of women did when we weren't looking at two-income households um so basically this suggestion here is for us to build new foundations of structural support and infrastructure in the form of community connection. Recommendations for community organisations. Um, what we were what we saw through the research is that many organisations are shifting from seeing themselves as doers of deeds broadcasters of information and keepers of answers and shifting more towards facilitators of community-led actions, facilitators of community-led answers. So we're not, it, we didn't hear organisations stepping back and just letting others do it, but they do, many organisations now are, are leaning towards operationing, op, operating more relationally, not just transactionally. So educating by conversation, not by broadcast. Um, people often say, uh, you know, I was um, in the fires in 2019 and part of the recent floods. Um, so, And people often will still say they don't know what to do and how to prepare, but real-life conversations actually work. Um, so doing things ultra-place-based, really local, really um, connected um, to, down to the level of here's my emergency plan, what's your emergency plan? Let's talk about that. Asking people specifically about what they already know and what they have questions about. Learning how to listen. Some people and some organisations are amazing at this. What we heard was some aren't. So for, for some organisations and, and we think about like the CFA, for example, 
The temptation is to do and direct. So the challenge is learning how to listen and understand. So this is where locals want to want to feel seen for their needs as well as their expertise. And the final piece here is accepting that this all takes time and it needs resourcing. So it's deep and slow work of relational organising. And I think, again, Friends of the Earth have this. Um, and it is um, share information sharing. All of this is what allows us to be efficient in times of peak crisis. So I really love this um, expression that came out of our research. We move at the speed of trust. Um, so we need to make and defend the time required for more relational ways of engaging um, in all their complexity. Um, it's sort of easier to measure clicks than conversations. Yep, so 20 people have read this, but we've only had two conversations. You know, how do we measure that? But we may have had many conversations because we're making connections and we are connecting in lots of different ways. So this all sounds great. and how do we do this when our pace of life is getting so fast, when we are um, having difficulty, um, you know, um, just even making ends meet? Um, so we need to be thoughtful and, and deliberate about it. You know, like I said, a good chat over a sausage sizzle or a knitting circle or a community fair. Um, a chat over wine and cheese, there's a lot of food recommendations in here. Um, thinking about disaster provokes anxiety. So we need gentle encouragement in the form of social connection, fun and community to face these fears. So in this way, the process actually becomes a part of the solution, building connected and caring communities. And this can happen in metro, in regional. You know, we focus in the regions but it can happen in both. Um, now, I'm not sure, Gabrielle, was that a hand up to ask a question? Please do. Um, a lot of this stuff was in churches. Yes. Yeah, I'm a member of a church and, yeah, we're a close little community and we all know each other really well yeah 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 and Absolutely. and like yeah. um when you become atheist and agnostic it's much harder because you're mm -hmm. out of the inner thing and like you know the um limited amount of charities uh uh don't run the same sorry don't run the same um don't run the same um, kind of intimacy that a church does. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's a real change in our society. And, and this is part of the reason why this is broken down in this way, um, that we don't have institutions like churches. Um, and, and we also uh, had communities where women were primarily not in the workforce, but they were working because this is work. We we know that this way of keeping the community together and holding this together is work. So yep. I think that, yeah, there's a lot of changes. So this is really us going, well, in our current location and situation, how do we do this? And um, we certainly had input from some church groups and church goers as well, which was really wonderful. And um, what you're saying is is exactly is exactly what we heard there. Yep. Um, so how do we do this um, when we need we need support? That's that's one of the key findings. Um, so we've got some recommendations for local government. Um, local governments grapple often with when to lead and when to follow, when to act. Uh, when to act on the community, when to act for the community, and when to act with the community. So um, we heard from our local government, we we talked to a number of different local governments across regional Victoria, um, and what they talked about was, you know, that prioritising care is, is a lot like 
prioritising money for primary prevention, which is the work we do, um, we know it works. We've got research to show that people who feel cared for, um, you know, the community works better, um, et cetera. But, um, you know, how do we resource it? Um, so budgets, capacity, bureaucracy, insurance, so much insurance, um, many of this get in the way. And um, community care and outreach is often, as I said before, seen as fluffy. It's seen as not real work. Um, councils can't do everything, um, but our research and other research that we access shows that communities want councils to be attending to more than just the three R's, roads, rates and rubbish. They are the level of power closest to the community. So when community leaders in local government um, uh Re respond to this there's so much passion so much credibility so much so much connection that can happen so investing in connection is really important people need the time and space to get to know each other before disaster strikes so um accessible community spaces we know that they're becoming harder to find um, and that means accessible means not only that people can actually maybe in a wheelchair get to them or a mum with a pram, but um, unlocked and available, you know. Um, where would you want to go if you're having a hard time and you just want to bump into another mum? Um, youth spaces are getting closed. Our libraries <laughs> are, are closing down. Um it's there's less and less funding for these things and less and less importance put on them. Um, investing in safety, um, you know, is is extremely important, um, both um, physical safety and mental health. So, um, for one fantastic example that came out of this was in Indigo Shire, which is in northern Victoria, um, a high school gym was funded from the Department of Education to refurbish. Um, and because the local principal had been through the 2019 bushfires, he decided to make the new gym suitable as uh, while they were refurbishing it for the community in part of the ev their evacuation planning and turned it into a recovery centre. Um, when I talked about libraries before, um, we have the example of a library and it's just escaped me exactly where it is, but it is within Victoria, where they've decided um, that they will have, uh, they'll put in showers um, and they're going to uh, make spaces for people to sit. So people who in general might need a little bit of support can come in and see it as a drop-in centre in a sense where they might be able to read a book or grab a magazine or chat to someone. Um, but then in an emergency, this is a place that the community is familiar with and can come in to. Um, the last thing is for local government is to notice when the community is ready. Sometimes government and, and any of us organisations, you go, I've got this great idea and this will work. And then it become it gets imposed upon the community but it's really about not just throwing money at things but um you know really thinking through and listening to the community and when the community comes with an idea really considering it so out of this particular work after we launched this a few weeks ago um we had three local councils in our area who were getting together to look at their risk management framework and in fact, embed their care management framework into it. So they are thinking about what it means to say yes rather than defaulting to no. So um, I think that's we're really excited to see how, how they go with that and what they come up with. So, um, and this speaks to this particular, uh, these particular quotes. Um, the care and risk assessment um, is really important. Have a safe to fail framework and recognise for local leaders when to, when to engage and enable and when to get out of the way and let the community do what they need. Um, 
like libraries, neighborhood house, like neighborhood houses are incredibly important um, places. They do some incredible work um, and are wonderful places for people to connect. Maternal child health centers, playgrounds, parks, senior centers, skate parks, men sheds. They're all really important for building that community. Um, more affordable community-based transport options, um, you know, would be fantastic. There's um, in particularly, and we did look right across Australia here in Sydney, the northern their northern beaches, and in South Australia, they have um, they have a ride system that takes people not only to medical appointments um, but you know to social activities, particularly for the elderly who may be a little bit less physically connected than others. Um, so festivals, art classes, community gardens, these are all things that our local government can support the community in. Almost there. Um, state governments. State governments have most of the ownership over our physical institutions. They're most responsible for health, education, housing and keeping the community safe. So we know they've got a big role in disaster prevention as well as mitigation and response. Um, through strong state-based climate policies and targets, appropriate planning laws, protecting the environment, investing in disaster-ready infrastructure from roads and bridges to power supply, coordinating with other states and federal leadership. Um, so one of the things that came out of this research and that we're, um, we're arguing here is that state governments, as well as federal governments, need to see themselves as market or community shapers, not just fixers. They need to get better at purpose and prevention, not just looking at what's wrong and trying to fix it. Sounds really obvious, but um, but it's not really happening. Um, so, you know, is the goal of our housing policy, for example, to help investors make money or ensure that every person who needs a home has one? So our recommendations for state government is that they, un they address underlying vulnerabilities because if you're already vulnerable before disaster strikes, you're hardest hit when shocks occur. Um, you know, and again, these will not be new to you, but um, the cost of living and housing crisis to the crisis in gender-based violence and lack of resources and support for women and children in need of safety. Governments can't wave a magic wand. They can't end loneliness. They can't make homes cheaper or make people go into essential careers like teaching or medicine. But they can much better shape the context in which those choices are made. So they can equip communities to deal with underlying vulnerabilities before disaster strikes. They can better measure community well-being, development and progress along with another with a range of indicators, not just economic growth. Most states and territories have some form of well-being indicators, emerging frameworks in place. Things like how healthy are we? How safe do we feel? Can we afford good homes? Can we access good education? And more. What's the quality of our natural environment? Do we have enough time? Can we get around easily to the places that we want to go? And do we feel connected? So we ask them to identify gaps and, and amplify what's working. So for people on the ground, state disaster efforts can still feel disjointed, crisis by crisis, grant by grant. Um, many existing programs ne need further support. Um, state governments can lead proactive conversations with councils, communities and organisations to better understand the gaps as well as not only the gaps but the strengths and successes because what we see in our communities are people know what they need. This is the supported bit. They can speak about what they need and they can say what it is, not have things imposed on them. Um, one example that we have um, is after the 2009 bushfires, the local community, um, after some time, organised um, a, a weekend away for people to go, let's just leave for a bit 
let's go to the beach, let's do something different. So this was from um, Eastern Melbourne. And they said, let's just go somewhere and relax. And it was so well received. It was loved. Everybody thought it was great. So when the government came in, they said, okay, we'll run that program for you. Um, and, and we've got these dates and we'll do this and we'll 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 get you some pamper packs and we'll get you out in the bush and we'll and no one wanted to do it because it was not what they were needing at the time. Um so you know so so celebrating that is it's lovely that they went that looks great but then they imposed upon it. So it was really to say how did you do that? What was the what was the benefit of that for you and how can we support you in other things you may think of? Building trust, very important. Um, we heard from, so state-based disaster recovery, we spoke to people in that sector. Um, we heard them say, we can get in community's way. Community knows best in a lot of cases and we don't want to get in there. And things like uh, toxic media narratives, um, even, you know, staffers trying to protect their boss or their minister's, um, you know, um, reputation. Um, that can all derail community goodwill and cohesion following a disaster event. So um, relationships are really key and transparency. How do we build and maintain trust? We heard that state governments are getting better at listening to community and actively supporting community to lead where possible. That doesn't mean there isn't lots of room for improvement, but there are improvements. And that was something we were really happy to hear. Um, my, so um, again, just a little um, quote from one of our disaster recovery specialists, Sally McKay. Um, you know, it, it's one thing to engage um, ask community groups and voice to take part. But how do you resource that work on the ground? And those are the conversations that are just starting. Finally, we look to the federal government. We know disasters are getting worse. We know why they're getting worse. And quite frankly, we're all pissed off about it. Um, so we want, we want governments to respond with conviction. Um, you know, we, it's one thing to face increasing threat levels, believing our leaders are doing absolutely everything in their power, but it's um, quite another one to believe that they're in denial either or impotent or actively making the issue worse. Um, I Again, I don't need to go through some of the things that we have to face in Australia, but, you know, we are one of the largest energy exporters. Um, so we have huge power and responsibility to act. We can't stop every disaster, but we can transform the context in which people experience them. Um, shifting from market-based, individualised and privatised responses to one that's collective and powered by the civilian public sector. Um, the industries, so, sorry, um, one of the things that we really saw is the increase in insurance costs. Um, so in the Alpine region, there are a number of businesses there that cannot get insurance at all. They just can't be insured. So they're going to need, they're closing down slowly. There are others that had their insurance tripled after the 2019 bushfires. That's absolutely unacceptable. Um, the, the insurance industry's response to the 2022 floods along the east coast of Australia was so poor that a parliamentary inquiry is due to report back uh, in September, where are we now in a couple of months? Um, but it's not just a few bad apples. The whole system is broken. Um, private insurance model found in academic, so private insurance model has been found in academic research to be privatising climate adaptation and weakening community solidarity in recovery. Um, it's increasingly unaffordable. Underinsurance is huge and a growing problem. So we haven't just looked at this and gone, so individuals, you need to connect, you need to do this. We've gone big. Um, so we're looking at, we are suggesting that the 
federal government look at a public model of insurance. Um, and because the Climate Council predicts one in 25 homes will be uninsurable by 2030. So if we do um, a public um, uh, insurance, um, that is going to shift the landscape considerably. Um, there are models to limit the Commonwealth government's over, overall financial exposure, um, and there is, in fact, catastrophic risk insurance that um, we, you can read more about in the report. Um, we want to build the capacity of citizens in disaster relief. Um, reliance on the Australian Defence Force is unsustainable, according to independent findings um, in a 2023 Defence Strategic Review. But civilians need more time, training and resources to be able to offer the right help in the right way in the right time. So we still need external surge capacity from outside of directly impacted communities. So we need, we recommend that federal government continue to strengthen resource and expand existing state and community-based emergency services while exploring options for a national civilian disaster relief corps. As I said, we're going big. We want to harness government for the well-being of people and planet. Um, four in five people want well-being of population to drive our leaders' decision making above other concerns. Um, there's significant research from the Centre for Policy Development. Um, we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But um, you know, our federal treasurer has started to talk a little bit about well-being economy, um, but that's very, very early stages, and we recommend really diving into that. It takes a long-term intergenerational lens to our challenges. Rosalind. I, I'd like to just, my observation has been that often with a disaster, firstly, we don't necessarily know the direction it's coming from and the community leaders are often impacted which we everyone has to be able to step up and take responsibility yeah but mm. we we do tend to leave things for those lovely leaders movers and shakers mm -hmm. but um Yes. I Look, I couldn't agree more, Rosalind, uh, because it's very hard work thinking about disasters coming. And, you know, many of us are um, impacted by not only uh, climate disaster, but then there are personal issues that come up and there are personal struggles that we have. So um, what we're hoping with this toolkit is that we can look at many different people looking at many different solutions so that where a community, say the as you have has said, the leaders may be impacted, that people are ready to step up and have that connection and have that willingness and knowledge. Often people don't step up because they don't know or they don't want to um, hurt others or they step up without knowing um, who needs the help or, or where. So that's some of the things that we're hoping to tease out um, to tease out with this work. And recent migrants, and there, there are quite a few groups in the community that don't necessarily merge easily. Like we have to be looking out for the disadvantaged. Yes. I, um, I, I, yeah. Sorry, go on. It's just including, well, inclusiveness is difficult for ordinary people. But anyway, we we're all learning. Well, yeah, and look, you know, um, often recent migrants really want to contribute to the community, but they don't know how because they don't understand the culture and they don't know, you know, what, what might be acceptable or not acceptable or whether their skills are of any use or not. So, again, this is where particularly in that case, I think local government are often really great resources for that and, and making space for community to come together, bringing leaders from different community groups together, um, whether they're migrants, um, whether they've been in the community, you know, for 100 years, um, 
you know, how do, how do we bring them together and make space for them and make physical public spaces, but also um, welcoming spaces too. Um, Gabrielle, did I see your hand up? Yeah. Yeah, one thing I've noticed that since um, recent disasters is um, markets, local markets, and they all network through the markets and, you know, to, and, you know, donation places to get clothes and things like that to replace things that were burnt out massively or things like that. Mm. And those kind of um, um, uh, things that are set up by communities often are really valuable for finding out what's going on and what other people are thinking and um, the general mood, you know, and that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, and that's what we found emerging. There are groups, um, particularly, I mean, we focused on the northeast of Vict got the Golden Valley in northeast of Victoria, but um, then went out and did talk to uh, across Australia, other areas. Um, and uh, it, it's that rise of local community groups, whether in metro areas or in regional areas, um, where a lot of the really rich uh, connection and community building is happening. And again, as you mentioned, Gabrielle, at churches um, and other faith communities, um, there is, um, you know, the Sikh community does some beautiful work feeding people through disaster. So many different faith communities can can uh, are bringing their thoughtfulness and their community mindedness into this. Um, so yeah, so I I I agree. It's 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 hard work. It's not. It's it's it sounds simple. Oh, just get a community together and talk. And it's not. It takes patience and time. Um, you know, because even within communities, people don't agree with things. So you know, it, a community over there isn't homogenous. Just you know, just like the community down the road isn't. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of slow community building work and what that can do is then support the whole community. We know that Mrs. So-and-so over there doesn't have family who can support her. So if her house is flooded, then someone can at least check in on her and see how she's doing because we know that that's what she needs. So there's, you know, that sort of work. Can I say one more thing? Um oh, please. P yeah. PTSD and, you know, depression and stuff, you know, for people who have been through several um, uh, disasters and um, <clears throat> just being very kind and listening goes a long way, you know, um, like, yeah, I've learned so much through other people, you know, just listening to them. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And it's making the space to do that is is so important and valuing that. And that is why we're calling this care through disaster because I agree, Gabrielle, that is that is what's going to support us and help us. Yeah. Um, so I've got a couple more slides. Um, there are three transformative things that we think government can do, um, which is a four-day standard work week, a universal basic income, and public jobs for the public good. Time poverty is harmful to our health, well-being, and a barrier to community connection. Um, trials of four-day standard working weeks have occurred in more than 21 countries. Um, Germany is trying it right across the country this year. Um, uh, so there is um, what we would suggest is that there is a Senate inquiry into work and care. Oh, sorry, it was recommended by a, a inquiry into work and care. Um, a universal basic income. Many Australians already support this, a majority do. In global trials, um, a modest 
UBI, Universal Basic Income, has been found to boost happiness, health and trust in social institutions. Um, so there is the Australian Basic Income Lab for modelling of how it can work here. Public jobs for the public good, including work on disaster repairedness, research, community building. So the, there's an American Climate Corps. Um, so it puts a new generation of Americans to work conserving our lands and waters, bolstering community resilience, advancing environmental justice, deploying clean energy, implementing energy efficient technologies and tackling climate change. Yep. So where to from here? Um, uh, my friends at Australia Remade um, has... Um, uh, quote, have looked to the UN Secretary General. Humanity has opened the gates of hell, <laughs> as he says, um, in response to the global onslaught of unnatural disasters. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we've got a track record of surprising ourselves in these sort of circumstances. Um, and you can look at Rebecca Solnit's work, um, particularly her A Paradise Built in Hell um, book. So, there isn't a single policy fix, but we need a new lens. And that's what Care Through Disaster is offering, a different lens to help us build now rather than wait for hell to happen and then try and build it. Let's work on it now. Um, we'll know we're succeeding when we take care as seriously as we take defence, when we measure our success, not by the size of our economies alone, but our capacity to care and be cared for through good and hard times. Our next step as an organisation is we're working towards a community of practice that will be open to everyone to bring practitioners together from across Australia to discuss how we can embed these principles into our own sphere of influence. So um, please feel free. There's uh, some contact details there. Um, we would love you to be part of that if that is your interest. So I 